Okay, everybody. Today we're going to complete the shiur that we started last week. And we'll do a review of what we did last week so everybody will be on the same page. And then we'll continue and finish this, uh, what I think is a very fascinating analysis. And that is the issue of how the Talmud conceives of the ideal Torah curriculum. What should we be spending our time studying? Should we spend all our time learning Rav Kook? Should we spend all our time learning Tanakh? Uh, so the Talmud itself tells us that based upon the pasuk, the verse in the Torah, Vishinantam Levanecha, you should teach them to your children. So the Talmud says, if you recall from last week, that the Talmud says, don't pronounce it Vishinantam, you should teach them to your children. And the word, as we pointed out last week, Vishinantam comes to the word Sheni. Repeat twice. Rather read it vishilashtam. You should. Uh, I'm not sure this is a word. Triplicate <laughs> instead of duplicate. You should triplicate your Torah learning of vishilashtam from the word shalosh. What would that mean? That the ideal Torah curriculum should be, as the Talmud says, tripartite. That divide your years into three parts is what the Talmud says, divide years into three parts, a third devoted to Tanakh, Mikra, the written Torah, a third devoted to Mishnah, the oral law, and a third devoted to Talmud. Okay, and uh, we'll review how we explain those terms in just a couple of minutes. The Talmud itself asked, uh, yes, Bruce? You didn't mention anything last time, the idea that when you're a young student, Perhaps it's referring to when you're young, you first learned Chumash and then Mishnah and then Gemara. And yeah, then when yeah, you're yeah. older, you do something else. I mean, you'll see. We're going to discuss that today. That's exactly today's topic. Yeah. That's exactly today's topic. So the, the Talmud itself asked a question about this. How is this person, uh, how are you practically speaking, so as to divide up your life into three parts? The first third of your life, devote to the Chumash. The second, a uh, third of your life you devote to Mishnah, the third to Talmud. Uh, how do you know how long you're going to live? So the Talmud says it must mean not that you divide up your entire life into three parts, you know, a third, a third, a third, but liyomi, by days. Now, what does that mean? So Rashi explained, according to the explanation given by Tosvot, it means you divide up each week. So two days of your week, Sunday, Monday, you'll devote to uh, the Mikra, the Chumash, the second two days of the week, you devote to Mishnah, and the next third, uh, two days, you devote to Talmud. And uh, that leaves Shabbat. So Shabbat, I don't know. <laughs> it's not clear what you do on Shabbat. You study Tanya on Shabbat. Okay. So, uh, so Tosfot has a uh, different explanation. Tosfot says, no, it, when the Talmud says liome by the day, it doesn't mean divide up the week into... Uh, three parts, each one being two days. That's the way Rashi understood it. But rather, each day should be divided to three parts. So you should uh, spend one third of the time you study Torah uh, each day on Mikra, studying the Chumash. The second third of the time allotted to study would be devoted to Mishnah. And the third part of each day that you're devoted to study would be devoted to Talmud. Okay, fine. We dealt with a couple of technical problems last week. One of them is the very bizarre method of deriving from the words Vishinan Tamlevanecha, you should teach them to your children that this tripartite curriculum. The Talmud says, don't read a Vishinan Tam, but Vishilashtam. So we know that exegetical technique, usually it's based upon taking the same consonants in the word in the Torah, but change the vocalization. Like, don't read it banaich ela bonaich. Don't read it your sons, but your builders. So that has a certain reasonableness to it, that perhaps on purpose, the Tanakh and the Torah doesn't have vowels printed in it in order to allude to multiple understandings, but at least it keeps the root, three consonants that make up the root. But don't read a vishinantam, but read a vishilashtam. It's actually changing the consonants. It's a little bit of a, a hard sell. 
to understand how that works. So the Torah community gave a very brilliant explanation, as we saw last time, that what the Talmud is really saying is, it's not that you should see in the word vishinantam uh, a different word altogether, but addressing the meaning of the word. Vishinantam means teach it clearly. Shanun means clear, sharp. Now, how do you teach the Torah clearly? It's by combining the teaching of the Torah, which is written, with its interpretation and analysis. That's the only way to get clarity is what the Torah actually means. So that's what the Talmud is really saying. Vishinantam levanecha. How does one teach Torah to your children in a way which is going to be sharp and clear? By combining the written law with the Mishnah and Talmud. That's how the Torah community explained the meaning of that particular passage. But we also saw that the founder of Chabad Hasidut, the Alta Rebbe, Rabbi Shneur Zalman of Ladi, said that perhaps this is all misguided, that a lot of times when the Talmud seems to derive a law from a pasuk in the Torah, we're using the pasuk as a, um, perhaps even a mnemonic device, mnemonic device that we're actually using it just in order to remember the particular law. Uh, and that's called an asmachta, that the law came first and then we're hanging it, we're leaning it on a particular pasuk. It, that we're wasting our time by trying to figure out how the law was derived from the pasuk, because it wasn't derived from the pasuk. It was after the fact attached to the pasuk, for whatever reason. Could you say that's, okay. a, general, that's a general rule? That okay, in general, so it's, hard, it's hard to know. The Talmud itself is, often says, oh, it's a smach de ba'alma. It's merely an after-the-fact association with the pasuk. Now, the Rosh, there's a famous Rosh where he says that, I, I actually don't remember the exact words, where he says most or all. I don't think he, I just can't believe we say all, but uh, I believe the language is like most. That most what look like deriving a halacha from a pasuk are really asmachta, uh, which makes a lot of sense to me. If, if for those of you, uh, that is all of you, who've experienced these midrash halacha, these apparent derivations from halacha, they're, they're very seldom utterly compelling <laughs> and sometimes rather strange. So it makes a lot of sense to say the oral law preserved these traditions and then the rabbis, for whatever reason, attached them to psukim. Now, by the way, what asmachta means is more complex than I just presented it. I presented it as if there's the halakha. After the fact, it was artificially associated with uh, psukim versus in Tanakh. We'll see. Uh, I would like to do this maybe moving forward to do a, a very sophisticated analysis of the whole mechanism of Torah Shemalpeh. And we'll see that there are Rishonim who say that's not what an asmachta is. It's not an artificial association with a pasuk. It's something else. But I don't want to tell you what that is because it's something that we'll discuss when we get there. Okay. Now, another issue that we discussed is uh, the terminology of the Talmud when it says a third devoted to Mikra, the written Torah, a third of your time devoted to Mishnah, and a third devoted to Talmud. Though that nomenclature is difficult. Why? because that tradition itself is coming from the time of the Mishnah. There was probably no book called the Mishnah when that, uh, that quotation was uh, first uttered. It's uttered by Atana, one of the teachers that is then quoted in the book that later is created called Mishnah. Even more significant is the term Talmud. Right? <laughs> there is no Talmud in the time of the Mishnah. The Talmud was written later. So what could that possibly mean? So we saw that the Rambam answers that question. And he defines these terms. And he says that when it comes to Mikra, the written law, okay, that's pretty clear what that means. That's not a problem. Now, the second category of Mishnah, that's not necessarily the name of a book, but it's a reference to the oral traditions, okay, which were later edited and put into the book called the Mishnah, but in fact, that term is used for these oral traditions, not necessarily to the literary work called the Mishnah. The reason it's called Mishnah is because these are traditions which were memorized. And uh, you memorize by rote, by repeating. So Mishnah from the word Sheni, those traditions which are memorized through repeating. And then he goes on to say that uh, 
what is Talmud then? Talmud is certainly not the book called Talmud, but it means rather analytical thinking. The ability to use a precedent and derive, extrapolate from the precedent to an unknown case, to think analytically about reasons, uh, to be able to formulate the halakha in more abstract terms, etc., to be able to know how to apply a halakha to uh, contemporary events, etc. That's all analytical thinking, and that's Talmud. Why is the book that we now call Talmud called Talmud? Because it contains analytical thinking, which is Talmud. Okay, so that solved that particular problem. But then we went on, and this is where we ended last time, dealing with a, uh, a practical problem, and that is, wait a second, this is a halakha psukha, this is a law which is codified in the Talmud about how one is supposed to learn Torah in terms of this tripartite uh, curriculum. We don't do that. The holy yeshivas, as we pointed out last time, they do divide their day to three parts. There's morning Seder, afternoon Seder, and night Seder. The only problem is that morning Seder is Gomorrah, Talmud. The afternoon Seder is Gomorrah, Talmud. And the evening Seder, is Gomorrah, Talmud. So uh, that's perplexing. How come that in the uh, curriculum, which is adopted in the traditional yeshivot, that we don't abide by this law, which is codified in the Talmud? Now, I, it's I, worth I, pointing out, I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, the Mishnah and Kedushan uh, basically talks about learning Torah, Mishnah, and basically um, Derech Eretz, in essence, being a, a mensch, being, being, fulfilling the mitzvah, actually doing. So why are we saying that it's divided into three types of learning when may, the last mode of learning should be doing the mitzvot? If we, otherwise we have no time to do mitzvot. Right. <laughs> okay. So perhaps, I mean, that's a very good point that at the end of the day, we're expected to apply Torah. So, uh, I mean, put it this way, maybe the way to explain that point is that uh, I don't know if the conception here is that every waking moment of the day is spent in the Beit Midrash doing nothing but learning, right? That's not the way most people can live their lives, even Torah scholars. You also do things, you know, you go home for lunch and you interact with your family and uh, and it's those times outside of the Beit Midrash when we actualize the, uh, the learning that we do. And the truth of the matter is there's plenty of actualization that goes on in the Beit Midrash. Even in the insular environment of a Beit Midrash, as uh, anybody here who's been in yeshiva knows, there's plenty of room for fighting with each other, arguing about closing the windows, opening the windows, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So that's a very good point. Uh, at, at the end of the day, Torah is for actualization. Okay. So how is it that we don't actually divide up Torah curriculum traditionally? Oh, I, I forgot. The one point I wanted to say was that there are yeshivot nowadays uh, that are uh, do, in fact, have part of their curriculum, Jewish thought and uh, Tanakh, etc. You find that mostly, let's say, in yeshivot hester. You don't find that type of uh, formal the curriculum which involves other subjects in the you know more traditional yeshiva okay so we saw Tosfot trying to explain this uh contradiction between what the talmud says and what we actually do i i pointed out last week uh to uh, dan that um a cl classical agenda of Tosfot is to reconcile what the talmud says with current practice and which is often a problem. We often don't behave. And I'm talking about Orthodox Jews. Even Jews who are committed to following Talmudic law, uh, the current state of practice is not always in, in harmony with what the Talmud says. And how does one reconcile that? So Tosvot, there's the last point we made last time, explains it by saying that when we study Talmud all day long, we are actually fulfilling the curriculum. Why? Because he quotes a passage in the Talmud that says, why is Talmud Bavli, which is what we study three times a day, why is it called Bavli? Because Bavli means mixed up. 
right? Le Valbel means mixed up. Why is Talmud Bavli called uh, the Talmud which is mixed up? It's not because it's confused, though it may be sometimes confusing. It's because it's a mixture of passages from Tanakh, Mikra, passages from the Mishnah, or from Brightot, which are traditions coming from the same time as the Mishnah, but not included in the Mishnah, and analysis. So every time we study Talmud, we're actually, in fact, doing the tripartite curriculum because the Talmud itself contains all three. That was the answer given by Tosvot, and that's the uh, conclusion of what we saw uh, as of uh, last week. Now we're going to move on. So I hope you have the source sheets, which were distributed last week, and I think Bruce sent them out again this week. I, I hope so. So let's learn our Rambam. And the Rambam talks about, after he defined what these terms mean, you know, a third of your day in Mikra, a third in Mishnah, a third in Talmud. So now he talks about how to apply it. So this is source number eight. Kate Saad, how do you apply this? Haya bal umanut. What if you work for a living? People actually do that, believe it or not. People work for a living. I know it sounds strange. So what do you do? So, okay, you work for a living, three hours a day. I find this really astounding that uh, I'm assuming this represents some type of uh, reality that uh, there was a time when in order to make a living, you didn't need to work more than three hours a day. Uh, so it's not really what happens nowadays, but uh, okay. Uh, three hours a day, you're going to work. Now, let's assume there are 12 hours of productive waking time in a day. That's the Ramah's assumption here, just to make it easy. So three of those hours, Nebuch, you had to work for a living. You're a plumber, work for three hours. Uva Torah. So now you have 12 hours of waking time. Leave nine hours left. What are you going to do with those nine hours? Otana Tesha, those, three, those nine hours. Kore B'Shalosh Mehen. So you're going to now uh, uh, apply the tripartite curriculum. curriculum. A Torah should be thought, uvushalosh b'tor shavalpeh, uvushalosh mitbonein v'dato lavin davar davar. So uh, the first three hours uh, of those nine hours left, you're going to learn Mikra. You're going to learn Tanakh. In the second of those three hours, so you're going to learn oral law, right? The Mishnah, the Mishnahic traditions. And the third, it's very interesting, he doesn't say Talmud, he says, Mit bonein bedato lavi davar mi davar. You're going to contemplate with your mind to understand one thing from another. So there's analytical thought, he doesn't even use the word Talmud. So a third of your time going over written law, a third of your time uh, going over the oral traditions, and a third of the time thinking about it, analyzing it. Okay. Then the Rambam says something fascinating. Under what circumstances are we talking about this tripartite curriculum? Only in the beginning of a learning career. Now, Bruce, remember I said we're going to talk about this? You didn't make that up, I assume. Uh, in somewhere lurking in the back of your memory there, you had learned this Rambam. So, uh, so he says, this tripartite curriculum is limited. It's limited to the beginning of a person's learning career. When a person uh, becomes greater in wisdom, and you no longer have a need to learn the written law. You know, you know the entire Tanakh by heart. There are people at Efrat that know the Tanakh by heart. I was once amazed. I, uh, I mean, truth of the matter is now I live in all own truth for many years. <laughs> there are a lot of people. Matter of fact, I, I'm just like sharing right now. Uh, you know, because of Corona, so the way we organize reading the Torah in the street minyanim, every, everyone does it differently. So one of the ways it's done, because we don't want to have a lot of people standing around the Torah scroll because of social distancing. So uh, in some of the minyanim in Alon Shvut, there's only one person at a time standing from the Torah. So how do you do that? You're called up to the Torah. Well, who's going to read it? You. 
the ole, the person who calls it the Torah, is going to be the one who reads the Torah. Well, that's a little high pressure honor there, because it means if you're given an aliyah, you're expected to be able to lane that particular passage in the Torah. That means pronouncing the words properly, and it means singing it properly. Now, people don't prepare, right? And it's amazing in Allah's truth, and I'm sure that many people in Ephraim the same way, they can do it. It's just randomly called up for an aliyah, and they lane it <laughs> perfectly with the vocalization and with the musical notes. It's actually awesome. I, I'm a lady, and I get a lot of aliyah because I'm a lady. I try to maintain a very low profile to avoid getting an aliyah <laughs> under those circumstances, lest I embarrass myself and the whole world. <laughs> so in any case, the, um, the Rambam is assuming that uh, a person who's a Torah scholar has achieved that level of proficiency in Mikra. After a certain while, you basically know Tanakh by heart. Okay? So you don't have to spend a lot of time going over that. Now, the same is true, he says, when it comes to Mishnah, because at a certain, it's, it's basically a bunch of traditions that need to be memorized. Mishnah, to repeat, wrote. Okay, so uh, after you've mastered that, let's say uh, uh, you're uh, 15 years old. So by the time you're 15, you know Tanakh, let's say 20. <laughs> you know Tanakh by heart and you know Mishnah by heart. And there are a lot of people, kids, they have contests. Probably in Efrat, this happens. There's little kids. They have con how many Mishnah they can memorize. Okay, so smart person, he knows all the Mishnah by heart. Okay, so now what do you do after that? So he says that, well, afterwards, right? Uh, so what are you going to do with your time? Because you've already mastered the written Torah. You've already mastered the oral traditions. So he says the following. Right? You know all that. So just occasionally you go up, you'll do review of the written law. The Divrei Hashmua and the oral traditions, you'll review them. Everyone else, yeah, I review, or else you might forget eventually. So you won't forget. What do you do with the bulk of your time now that you've mastered written law and oral traditions? That he will uh, use all of his time for only Talmud. Only Talmud. Lefirochav libo, in a way which corresponds to the literally the expanse of his heart, the Yishuv Dato, and uh, how focused a person is. Okay, the way it's translated in this translation, which is not my translation, according to his ambition and his ability to concentrate. Well, that's pretty amazing. According to the Rambam, this tripartite curriculum is indeed the halacha, but only up to a certain stage in your intellectual development. Once you've mastered the written law and the oral law, after that, only Talmud. Only Talmud. Fine. Now, I want to show you something fascinating. What's the Rambam doing here? Why does he say, eventually, you should only study Talmud? <coughs> so I want to take a look at the two most famous commentaries on the Rambam's Mishneh Torah. So first, we're going to see the Kesef Mishnah. The Kesef Mishnah is none other than Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. He also wrote, he was a busy person. <laughs> in addition to him writing this magnum opus of the commentary in the tour, the Beit Yosef, which then became the Shulchan Aruch, the abridged form, and this magnum opus on the, his commentary in the Mishnah Torah, he also was a great mystic, um, so uh, he was a busy person. So in his commentary on the Rambam's mission tour on this phrase, he says the following. He quotes the Rambam that says that this is only the beginning of your learning career. At the end, you only study Talmud. He says, Zed Davar Pashut. Where'd the Rambam get it? One of the main things that the commentators of the Rambam are concerned with is the source of the Rambam. The Rambam never quotes, almost never, quotes sources. 
just says the halakhas if it like came out of Sinai, you know, with no context. He doesn't quote the Talmud and, you know, where'd he get this from? So he says, guess if Misha says, you know where he got it from? Because it's obvious. That's where he got it from. Why? Because the truth of the matter is, as we all know, Talmud is hard. Gemara and Talmud are by the same thing. Gemara, Talmud is hard. It's hard. You know, a pasuk in the Torah, you can read it and translate it. Okay. Uh, Mishnayot, you memorize them. But the Talmud is a very difficult book to learn. Uh, Bruce, hang on a second. Let me just finish his words here. That type of uh, concentrated devotion to understand the Talmud is not true when it comes to Mikra, the written Torah, and Mishnah, memorizing the old traditions. So it needs a lot of work. And then the Kesa Mishnah concludes, And it's upon this that the world relies that we don't, in fact, use the tripartite curriculum. Remember, Tosvot gave the same, you know, gave a similar answer that um, the, or no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not the same answer, but the same problem. How, what do you do about the fact that we don't do this tripartite curriculum? So Kestef Mishta gives an answer based upon the Rambam. The reason we don't do this is because at a certain stage, you can more or less master the written Torah, you can more or less master memorizing the oral traditions, but understanding Talmud requires a lot of work. And that's why mature students should spend all day long studying Talmud, or that's what we do, because it's hard. It's a greater challenge. That is the answer of the Kesem Mishnah. That's how the Kesem Mishnah explains the Rambam. So I saw that there, uh, Bruce had his hand up, and uh, like there might have been some other questions. If, so, uh, if they knew that we're doing it with an art scroll, like in English, where we really read it, I mean, I do Daf Yomi with my Chavruta, and you know, I can't say that there's pain and effort like the days when I was with you in yeshiva where we would do part of a daf and not know what we were doing. <laughs> so yeah. would they say that, you know, reading it and, and like it's the process or is it really getting the information which we can so easily access today? Okay, so I, I mean, I'm not sure I understood the two options because I, I would have assumed a third option which seems different than the first two. And that is that the um, Kesef mission is assuming that I, I, and you'll, I actually think I mentioned this last week. I used to have a Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Parnas, in yeshiva, who, if he felt that students didn't really understand the Talmud, he would say, don't dive in the Talmud. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of an insulting thing to say about davening. <laughs> davening is synonymous for uh, a complete mindless uttering of words. <laughs> It's not the way it's supposed to be, by the way, but it often is, unfortunately. That's not what Talmud is. As a matter of fact, I would say almost by definition, since Talmud is analytical thinking, without total analytical thinking, without in total cognitive engagement with the text, struggling to understand it, I'm not sure what the point is. Well, that's what I was asking. Sometimes there was a struggle where we didn't really understand what we were doing. Today we learn it, we read it, we can discuss every aspect, but it, I, I wouldn't call it a struggle necessarily. We, we can read it like we read Tanakh and, you know, again, in English and anything else. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. and I'm not, so I'm wondering I if that's say, what they meant. No, it cannot possibly be what the Rambam means, right? Because the Rambam is saying the reason we're spending more time is because to understand it requires a greater amount of work. But if you're only davening it, you'll forgive the expression then you might as well just spend a third of your day because you know, if you're dominating it, that doesn't require any particular um, greater devotion of time. It's because it's so ban banning an art scroll is a good idea or not a good idea in yeshiva? <laughs> and what's, what's the bottom line with it? Should, should students learn with their art scroll? Yeah, yeah. I would not? say the following. that I mean, This is a little bit off topic, but I would say that uh, art scroll is uh, a, a very powerful aid to Talmud study, but uh, shouldn't replace the struggling with the text. So we'll leave it at that. Okay. So that's the Kesef Mish's understanding of the Rambam. Just Rabbi yeah. Zeff, quick question. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because it's coming up in the Kesef Mishnah as well as uh, 
in, in the in the um, in the in the Mishnah Torah, this Tchilat Tamudo. He says Tchilat Tamudo. What was above only applies to Tamud. But the guy's already in a profession. So, what time period is considered? Yeah. So, what it means is uh, now again, uh, the when the Ram talked about the uh, when someone is working, because he wanted to just try to define by hours how this law would play itself out. So, once if a person has to work, so that means only part of their day is available for learning Torah. But that part of the day should be divided into three parts. What, what the Rambam means when he says mudo, it means after you've mastered Tanakh, you know it cold. And after you've mastered memorizing the oral traditions, you know that cold. That's Tzchatli Mudo. Now, obviously, for me, I'm still Tzchatli Mudo, right? I have, do not know the Tanakh by heart, and I don't know the Mishnah by heart. So, um, but, but theoretically speaking, that's what the Ram is referring to. Tzachim Udo means the intellectual stage at which a person is, uh, has mastered Tanakh and the old traditions. By the way, I just want to point out just to get a little reality check here. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. But the, um, you know, we imagine a world with no internet, <laughs> no Netflix, no newspapers. Like, life was, I'm not saying it was better, but it was simpler. And I could imagine a reality where, uh, because there was a, you know, less distraction that people at a fairly early stage who were smart and serious really did know Tanakh by heart and knew the Mishnah by heart. I can imagine such a thing. By the way, I see this in Alon Shvut as well, Sfardim. The Sfardim who live in Alon Shvut tend to know things by heart. I don't know exactly why that is, uh, but it's not a like, um, uh, I can't imagine knowing all this information. People know it. As a matter of, I'll just tell you a quick story. I was once um, at a wedding and there's a Sephardic rabbi who is the Masajar Kiddushin, who's performing the wedding. And I happen to be quite close to the bride. And they gave me an honor. The, um, the rabbi performing the wedding, Sephardic rabbi, he didn't have a siddur. He did all the things that rabbis do at weddings. He just did it by heart. So I was called up to, I don't remember what, but I had to say something, <laughs> something from the ceremony. And like, I sort of whispered to the rabbi, like, what? Well, <laughs> I'm not Sephardic. I don't know anything by heart. He said, I'll help you. <laughs> so I'm just pointing out that like uh, the notion of uh, mastering completely, uh, you know, these two levels of Mikra and Mishnah, you know, it's not pie in the sky. People do it even nowadays. Svi, you had a question. There was another person who had a question. Svi, Svi, what was your yeah, question? Um, what, uh, what, at the sign off for a second, but at what age do you master stuff according to the Rambam? Yeah, so he doesn't say, but, um, you know, it, it could be, uh, I mean, th there isn't, uh, there's a famous Mishnah that talks about the each age, sort of like stages in life, uh, uh, but I don't think that's particularly old for this. He doesn't define it, and that's because, for good reason, it's individual. He's just saying, at the point in your learning career that you've mastered the two first levels, then you devote the rest of your time to analytical thinking. Okay. okay. Now I want to take a look at the, uh, another yeah. very famous commentary on the Talmud, the Lecha Mishnah. The Lecha Mishnah was written by a rabbi from Salonika, from Greece, who lived in the 16th century, uh, Rabbi Avram D. Bouton. And he says the following. He's, quote, he's commenting on the Rambam. When the Rambam says, it's only the beginning of your career, after that you should learn only Talmud. He says the reason the Rambam wrote this is because he wanted to, in the spirit of Tosvot, to reconcile the fact that we, so this is even in the 16th century, they only studied Talmud. Right? What about the tripartite curriculum? So 
He says that's what motivated the Rama. The Rama had to come up with a distinction. The distinction was that we only study Talmud later on uh, because the other because it's the hardest. The other two things are are easier. Okay, Laze Amar Misfar Denafshe, and he, he, where did he get this distinction from? Right, that uh, Talmud uh, requires more of your time. It represents a greater uh, level of intellectual sophistication. After you've mastered the first two levels, then you devote yourself to this, the rest of your time and the rest of your life to this uh, third, more uh, advanced level. He says he made it up. That, he says, he made it up. He made it up. Okay. And then he actually quotes Rabbeinu Tam, which we saw last week, that there's another way of explaining the, the, the uh, lack of harmony between current practice and the Talmud, and that's the fact that Talmud contains all three things. We saw that last time. Okay, so that's his explanation of, of the Rambam, that where did he get it from? He made it up, and he made it up in order to reconcile the distinction between the Talmudic law and current practice. Now, I'm going to suggest a totally different way of understanding the Rambam, that the Rambam was not necessarily trying to reconcile current practice of Talmud, 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 with the Talmudic recipe of Mikra, Mishnah, and Talmud, but for a very different reason. I also have to warn you that what I'm about to say is speculation and could be utterly wrong. We're going to take a look at an ultra-controversial passage in the Rambam's Guide for the Perplexed. And before I read it, I just want to sh share with you a comment that was written by a rabbi who lived a short time after the Rambam. And he says the following. This is uh, Shem, uh, it's um, uh, uh, Shem Tov Ben Yosef Ibn Falkira. This is not the, uh, the head of, the, uh, of Dubai. <laughs> Ibn was also a, <laughs> okay, son of. He says the following, Amar Shem Tov, so he's quoting this uh, rabbi here, Rabbi Me'achachamim Arabanim, there are many rabbinic sages, Amru, that said the following, Hizah Perak, the chapter in the Rambam's Guide for the Perplex, which we're about to read in a, in a few moments, Lo Kitavo Harav, the Rambam couldn't have written it, he didn't write it. A whole chapter in the Moran Nebuchim, the Rambam didn't write it. Vim Kitavo, and if he did write it, it should be hidden away. And even better, it should be burnt. Okay? Because how could he have said the following? Now, I'm not going to tell you uh, what is objectionable. You'll see in a second it's objectionable. But this is quite amazing that uh, there was a rabbinic opinion that he couldn't have written it. And if he did, it should be hidden away or better yet, burnt. Now, you're probably wondering. What could the Rambam have said that was so offensive? So we're going to turn now to the uh, next page. And we're going to read this chapter in the Guide for the Perplex. The Guide for Perplex was written in Arabic. So I don't feel too guilty just reading this in English, since even the Hebrew would be a translation from the Arabic. By, by Arabic. the way, Shem Tov was an expert in Arabic. He wrote a dictionary. Yeah, right. right. So yeah, I'm not surprised, of course. Uh, in any case, so we're going to read it in English. The present chapter does not contain any additional matter that has not been treated in the previous chapters of this treatise. This is at the end of the Guide for the Perplex. It is a kind of conclusion, and at the same time, it will explain in what manner those who worship God, who have obtained a true knowledge concerning God, it will direct them how to come to that worship, which is the highest aim man can attain, and show how God protects them in this world so they are removed to eternal life. This is like quite a, uh, a framing of this chapter. The Rama is going to tell us uh, a spiritual path. How, could, how to come to worship God on the highest possible level. Well, ready for this? Put in your seatbelts, please. I will begin the subject of this chapter with a simile. A king is in his palace, and all his subjects are partly in the country and partly abroad. Of the former... Some have their backs turned towards the king's palace and their faces in another direction altogether. And some are desirous and zealous to go to the palace, seeking to inquire in his temple and to minister before him. 
but have not yet seen even the face of the wall of the house. Of those that desire to go to the palace, some even reach it and go round about in search of the entrance gate, but they never get in. Others have passed through the gate and walk about in the antechamber, and others have succeeded in entering into the inner part of the palace and being in the same room with the king in the royal palace. But even the latter do not immediately on entering the palace speak to the king or speak to him, for after having entered the inner palace, another effort is required before they can stand before the king at a distance or close by, hearing his words or speak to him. Okay, so this is his analogy, and we're wondering what the heck is the Rambam talking about here? So he says, well, now I'm going to explain this analogy that there's all kinds of people and their relationship to the palace and the king that's in the palace. I will now explain the simile that I have made. The people who are abroad, the furthest from the palace, are all those that have no religion, neither one based on speculation nor one received by tradition. Such are the extreme Turks, with all due respect to the Turks, that wander about in the north, the Kushites who live in the South, and those in our country who are like these. I consider these as irrational beings, not as human beings. They are below mankind, but above monkeys, since they have the form and shape of a human being and the mental faculty slightly above that of a monkey. So they are human beings that have no religion whatsoever, and they are essentially monkeys plus. Okay, fine. Uh, those who are in the country, so a little bit closer to the palace, but have their backs turned towards the king's palace, are those who possess religion, belief, and thought, but happen to hold false doctrines. So they're religious, but what they believe is false, which they either adopted in consequence of great mistakes made in their own speculations, they thought about it, they adopted the religion, and they were in error in their thinking, or received from others who misled them. Their teachers taught them a religion which is false. Because of these doctrines, they receive more and more from the royal palace, the more they seem to proceed. Their so-called spiritual life actually removes them from God as they become more and more involved in their false religion. These are worse than the first class who have no religion at all. And under circumstances, it may be necessary to slay them, not day them. <laughs> oh boy, the Rambam uh, was not subtle and to extirpate their doctrines in order that others should not be misled. So these are very dangerous, more dangerous than the first, because if someone just doesn't have religion at all, they don't threaten religion. But if somebody has a uh, claim to religion, uh, but it's false, in a sense, that's more dangerous. Well, let's keep going to the people who are closer to the palace. Those who desire to arrive at the palace and to enter it, but have never yet seen it, are the mass of religious people, the multitude that observe the divine commandments. This means Jews, Orthodox Jews, right? The masses that observe the mitzvot, they observe the Shulchan Aruch. And we turn the page, but are ignorant. So Jews who are orthopractic, they observe the commandments, but on a very low level of sophistication, they don't really have an understanding. So they actually don't go into the palace. They're, they've approached closer, but they're not in the palace, right? Who's in the palace that we want to have a relationship with? The king, right? Uh, God. Those who arrive at the palace, but go round about it. So there's some who actually get to the wall. They get to the wall of the palace, but do circles around and around. Are those who devote themselves exclusively to the study of the practical law. What does it mean for practical law? Halakha. They spend all their time learning halakha. They believe traditionally in true principles of faith. They recite the Rambam's 13 principles of faith every day in the Sidur and learn the practical worship of God, but are not trained in philosophical treatment of the principles of the law. So they have a, they don't think about it philosophically. They observe the law, they study the law. Uh, they know what the basic beliefs are, but they don't think about it philosophically. So where are they? They're going around the palace, around and around and around, but never get in. And they do not uh, endeavor to establish the truth of their faith by philosophical proof. Fine. Now, what about those who get closer to the king? Those who undertake to investigate the principles of religion, 
now they're thinking philosophically, have come into the antechamber. They're actually now got beyond the wall. They're in the palace. And there is no doubt that these can also be divided into different grades. Once you're in the palace, though, there's a lot of chambers till you get to the king. But those who have succeeded in finding a philosophical proof for everything that can be proved, who have a true knowledge of God so far as true knowledge can be attained and are near the truth wherever an approach to the truth is possible, they have reached the goal and are in the palace in which the king lives. Now, I want to go back to that uh, uh, shame to Ben Yosef Ibn Falakira. I skipped the, la the latter part of what he said. To so go back to source 11, I just want to show you uh, uh, how he expresses why people felt that the Ramam either didn't write this, or if he did write it, it should be hidden away or even burnt. So in the second line, he says, Ki eich amar ha ki ha How could it be that the Rambam would claim that people who are intellectually sophisticated, they you know, know all about uh, you know, science, etc. Because when in the Rambam's time, when you said philosophy, philosophy included science, right? Uh, you know, we say physics and metaphysics, right? The Rambam, it's the same thing. It means to understand reality, understand truth, which part of that is understanding the way the world works scientifically and how to un understand it philosophically. Physics and metaphysics, all the same. So he says, how could it be the Rambam's implying those people who are trained in intellectually. They're at a higher level than those people who are involved in religion, right? Studying halakha. And all, all the more offensive to say that they're going into the palace, the inner chamber. If that's so, according to Rambam, philosophers who are engaged in natural law and in philosophy, trying to understand God, they're higher than people who study Talmud all day? Cannot be. He couldn't have, couldn't have said it. And if he did, it should be hidden away for better part. Okay. So this is a very controversial- Because passage. it's not true or because it's like dangerous material? Because it, it creates a priority. Uh, well, put, actually, it's a very good question you're asking. Not that your other questions aren't. <laughs> but that uh, it, it, it could be that the, there's a certain intellectual arrogance one could perceive in the Ram's approach. Ram has this philosophical approach that says, I can understand reality using my intellect not only understand reality in terms of the natural world, but also metaphysics. I can understand things about God, not just based upon accepting what somebody told me, tradition, but based upon thinking clearly, critically, philosophically about things. So I could imagine someone saying, that's very dangerous. Well, you think, you think that you have the intellectual equipment to understand God? We understand God through tradition, not through critical thinking. Okay, now. I want to now try to go back to the Rambam. In light of this passage from the Guide for the Perplexed, I want to show you something amazing. Remember what the Rambam said? That in the beginning of the intellectual career, you study Mikra, and then you study your old traditions. You memorize them. You got everything down pat. Then the rest of your intellectual life, you study Talmud. So people explained it in different ways. There was a way to explain why we study Talmud in contemporary yeshivas or because the book of the Talmud is hard. It's not what the Rambam meant, I want to claim. Look, I want to show you another passage from the Rambam, source number 13. The oral traditions, that's what he means by Kabbalah. It doesn't mean Kabbalah. The oral traditions are part of Torah Shabal Peh, the middle part, Mishnah. But in your note, Hanikrim Pardes, but thinking philosophically, which is called Pardes, the Rambam says in Hilchot Yusudei Torah, Pardes, he thinks, is philosophical thinking. Bichlal HaTalmud. That's Talmud. That's incorporated in analytical thinking. 
which he called, that's called Talmud. The Ram says that's analytical thinking and philosophical thinking is incorporated in the category called Talmud. Now look, now go backwards. What the Rambam say? When you're young in intellectual development, spend your time in, you got the Tanakh down pat, you can lay in any Parsha. The second element, you memorize the Mishnayot, the oral traditions, great. But look what the Rambam said. If you want to enter the palace and you want to have a private audience with the king, in the Guide to the Plex, he says, how do you achieve that? Through philosophical thinking, through understanding, through logic, the reality of God and philosophical truth and the, the reasons why the mitzvot are true and our, uh, our theological thinking is true. That's done through philosophical thinking. That's the highest level of intellectual spiritual development. That's how you get to the king. And that's what the Rambam meant when he said that when you're young and immature, Tanakh and oral traditions, memorize them. But you want to get to the king, Talmud. Devote yourself to Talmud. Why? As he says here, his Talmud is philosophical thinking. And that is the way to get to. Hey, the here's Barak the painter saying hello to the rabbi. Hi. <laughs> Just say. Thank you. Okay, now I want to show you something fascinating. So, and then with, we'll end with uh, the next speaker is about to begin. Hold on one second. Let me mute myself. Yeah. So I want to show you, remember we talked a little about before, we quoted the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chabad Hasidut. He codifies this halacha too. And he was looking at the Rambam. This tripartite halacha. Look how he says it. Ach peru shamikra, the interpretation of Tanakh, udrashot, so uh, the interpretation of the Tanakh and our oral traditions, that's part of Mishnah. Fine, nothing new there. Because the Mishnah is the explanation of the certain 13 mitzvot which are in the Torah. Nothing new there. Now look what he says here. And compare this to the Rambam. The Rambam ended up by saying, and philosophical thinking, which is called Pardes, is included in the term Talmud. Now look at Shulchan Aruch Harav. The wisdom of the Kabbalah. And here, he, when he used the word Kabbalah, he means Kabbalah. Mysticism. Jewish mysticism is included in Talmud. The Rambam, with this, my concluding remarks, and... The Alter Rebbe are both saying the same thing. And this is extremely important takeaway. The entire point of learning, according to the Rambam and according to the Alter Rebbe, are to access the king, to establish a meaningful relationship with God. That's the, that's the point. It's not a cognitive exercise. And it's not just telling you how to act. That's, that's the halakha. But ultimately, everything is directed to becoming a God-centered person, to understand what God is and have a relationship with God. Is that achieved through philosophical endeavor? Rambam. Is that achieved through Kabbalistic endeavor? Yalta Rebbe. But that's the point. That's the end zone. And that's why Talmud is the end zone of one's learning. And that's why one has achieved in an earlier stage of intellectual spiritual development, proficiency in Tanakh, and then in Mishnah, one devotes themselves exclusively to Talmud, but Talmud in the sense that the Rambam is defining it, and the sense the Alter Rebbe is defining it, that it is the accessing of the truth of the nature of God and one's relationship with God, either through philosophical understanding, the Rambam, or through Kabbalistic understanding, like the Alter Rebbe, because that is the end all and be all of existence. And it is through that that we ultimately uh, access our private audience with the king and eternal life to the soul, as the Rambam has said. And with that, we will have finished this particular topic. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi Zaf. My pleasure. Thank you.